So again, my name is Bethany Falvey. I'm the Heritage Trust Fund Grant Manager at the Kansas Historical Society. And this is for the 2022 Heritage Trust Fund Grant Round. So some uh, Heritage Trust Fund Program Background, or HTF is how I'll refer to it the rest of the presentation, was created in 1990. And to date, we've awarded over 27 million in awards over the past 31 years. Um, and the funding comes from every county of the state and it's collected from the Register of Deeds. In 2016, the way that the funding came, um, the formula was revised. Um, and the statute mandates that grant funds are dispersed among the state um, as evenly as just, um, possible. So the committee will take that into consideration when they are reviewing um, applications. And half of the funds by statute have to go to city, counties, or historical, local historical societies. Through this program, the Kansas Historical Society has the opportunity to help communities realize their preservation goals and increase interest in their historic resources. So here's just some numbers. Um, the maximum grant award is $90,000, and that's the max that you can request. The minimum reward is $5,000, and for most, it'll be a reimbursement of up to $80,000. For-profit corporations are reimbursed 50%, and they have to demonstrate that they have the other 50% match. If you are not a for-profit corporation, then you're gonna fall under that 80% of reimbursement and recipients need to provide 20% match. The match needs to be cash. No donated or indirect matches are um, eligible. And you need to have at least the 20% match demonstrated um, available no later than November 1st, 2021, which is the deadline for the grant. And it's a lot better if you can demonstrate that you have more than the 20% or at least show that how you're gonna cash flow the project. Because this is a reimbursement grant program, applicants are expected to pay for all consultant and construction costs as they become due and payable. The HTF will reimburse up to 80% of those costs or 50% um, upon receipt of documentation of the completed work and evidence of payment by the applicant. So what are eligible properties? In order to be eligible for the grant, the property needs to be listed on the National Register or the Kansas Register of Historic Places or a contributor to a historic district that's on the Kansas or the National Register. Properties that are owned by the state or federal government are not eligible. And it, you might take note that a lot of historic districts have non-historic or non-contributing properties located within their districts. These do not qualify for the grant. You have to be listed as contributor to the district. And if you're unsure of the status of your property, you can email us, call us, or um, we have an online searchable database, um, KHRI. Um, it's our GIS um, database. A little bit more about um, eligible applicants. The applicant must own the property in most cases. An exception might be something like a cemetery, um, but you still need to make reasonable effort to locate the owners and get permission and, and an agreement. And all owners must consent to the application in writing. So if there's more than one owner, all property owners must agree in writing to apply for the grant and include the documentation with the application. Properties owned by boards, trusts, or commissions should include documentation of a vote approving the application. Examples of owner types are private owners, nonprofits, local and county governments, and again, for-profit corporations at that 50%. A little bit more about for-profit corporations. The owners, and this is by statute, 
the owners need to demonstrate that the property's continued existence is threatened or its rehabilitation is not economically feasible without the grant assistance. So for-profit corporations just need to provide a bit more explanation in their application um, for the committee to review. So what are some eligible activities? Well, you can see the program information for um, more detail, and that's on our website, um, but it has to be um, rehabilitation, which could include upgrading mechanical systems, remodeling a bathroom, restoration, which could be reconstructing a missing feature, and you need to provide documentation, um, generally a photograph um, or drawings. Preservation would be to maintain or repair the historic materials, activities to halt deterioration, erosion control in the case of an archeological site. Um, and then there are some non-construction activities such as historic structures reports, maintenance plans and construction plans. And those are used to um, help with planning documents. If you know that you need to do work on the building, but you're not sure where to start, one of those might be a good option. All work needs to conform with the Secretary of Interior standards for treatments of historic properties. I've linked it here, um, but there's more information on our website or if you go to National Park Service and TPS is the Technical Preservation Services and Standards. While all these activities are eligible, some projects are more successful than others. In general, proposals that repair or preserve the exterior envelope of a building compete better than projects to simply update an already stable and sound building. So if you have a roof falling in, but your grant request is for floor repair, you might think about doing the roof repair um, as that's gonna compete better and it's a higher preservation priority than repairing your floors. And no work um, can begin until, if the grant is awarded, until after awards are announced, the grant administrator has attended an orientation session, the owner has signed a grant agreement and competitive bidding has taken place. And grants are awarded at the February 2022 Historic Sites Board of Review meeting. What are ineligible activities? Um, additions, interpretive displays, equipment purchases, major reconstructions. Um, like we had talked about, you can do smaller components of reconstructions based on evidence, but anything major, like a whole wing of a building would not be eligible. But say you wanted to restore a porch, that would be an eligible project. Um, relocation of structures without approval, grant administration expenses, and general maintenance. Now, general maintenance is at the discretion of the grant review committee. Keep in mind that there are certain things that all property owners are expected to do towards maintaining their buildings. For example, cleaning the gutters or touching up the paint. Now, if it's included as part of a project, say you have rotted wood siding and your grant proposal is to um, replace and restore the siding, the painting portion could be included, but just doing painting would not compete well as that is falling under general maintenance generally. And again, you can look in the program information for additional um, activities. Now, it's important to know, again, this is a reimbursement grant program. Grantees are expected to maintain cash flow and pay consultants and contractors per your contracts with your contractor or consultant as they come due. Once you have provided us documentation of payment with your reimbursement request, we can process those requests as quickly as possible. So you pay 100% of the bill and then the HTF will reimburse the grantee 80% or 50% of those expenses upon approval of the reimbursement request. 
A reimbursement request needs to include photos of the completed work, a bill or invoice of the work, proof of payment, and then a request form we have. HTF cannot directly pay your contractors or consultants. So keep that in mind when you're putting together your budgets that you can maintain the cash flow. What happens after a grant is awarded? We have a project agreement that spells out the scope of work, schedule, reimbursement criteria, and other conditions of the grant award. And that scope of work and schedule are pulled directly from your application. So it's important to have a realistic timeline when you're putting that together, keeping in mind that if you're awarded a grant, you have to attend orientation, work through this project agreement, go out to bid. So realistically, a project's not going to start earlier than summer, at least, of next year. Um, the grant administrator attends that orientation. And then you also submit monthly progress reports to keep us in the loop. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to visit every site every month. Um, so those progress reports are our eyes on the ground. So it's really important that um, those have all the details of what's happening with your project. Um, again, no work, no project can begin work until the project agreement is signed the grant administrator has attended the orientation and competitive bidding is followed. So the application deadline for this year is November 1st, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. It's an online um, application. And if you applied last year, we're using the same platform submittable and the link is on our website and I'll go to that after um, we get through a couple more slides. Um, we are not doing preliminary applications this year. Um, it's a highly competitive grant. We generally have about 60 applicants per year. And um, due to that high volume, we've uh, decided not to do preliminaries. So the applications are due complete November 1st, 2021 with the awards being announced in February, 2022 at the Historic Sites Board of Review meeting. And I don't have that date yet for the um, February meeting, um, but we should have those by November when the applications are due. Um, so here's the link, but I'll also show you in a minute um, where to find it on our website. They're due by 11.59 p.m. Actually, Submittable won't allow you to submit after that. Um, it kind of automatically shuts off at 11.59. And in order to do that, you need to create a Submittable login account and then select Apply to begin the application. Now, you can invite collaborators to the application form. So say um, you're, you have a board and you have a couple people working on it. Um, you can have those collaborators and you can save your draft and continue work later. Lauren, I'm going to share my screen and um, show how to find the application. So if you go to kshs.org and then hover over the preserve tab, you go to grants and then heritage trust fund HTF is right at the top. So you click that. We've got um, information about the 2022 grant round. And there's also the 2021 awardees. So you can see what was awarded and how much and kind of the county disbursement if you're interested. Um, so before applying, again, read through the program information. I think it's an 11 page PDF. And then you also need to sign the assurances page and attach it to your application. But then to access the application, you click here to submit. And then it pulls you up to submittable and it's kshs.submittable.com slash submit. So there's a little bit of information here. It gives you the link back to 
this website, our website, um, and you just hit apply. And then if you don't have an account, you have to sign up. Um, if you do, you can just fill it in and then it will take you to your, um, to the application. Warren, you can go back to the website or to the uh, presentation. So we're gonna go kind of step-by-step step through the application um, and give you some tips and hints uh, to uh, completing a successful application. So again, before you're starting to apply, it's really important to read through the program information. It gives you all of the information about the nitty gritties of the grant before you apply. Um, so the first part of the application, sections A through C, um, at the top, you'll want to find your historic property name. And some properties may not have a historic property name, and so you can just put the address. An easy way to do that is to search on our KHRI database, um, and I've included a link in the application, so you can do that. But if you're having trouble locating your name, again, you can call or email us and we can help you, certainly. And then sections A through C are a lot of just basic information. Um, the applicant is the legal property owner as of November 1st, 2021, and who would remain the owner throughout the duration of the project, plus five years from the date of project closeout. If the property has more than one owner, all parties must provide proof of agreement with the application and a funded agreement with the project agreement. If you are required to provide proof of ownership, you can add it on to section P of the application. B is um, the property's historic name, which you've searched at the top, um, the legal street address of the property, including the zip code, and if applicable, the city and county it's located in. Now, some properties are pretty rural, so you can put the city that's on the property record card, or the nearest city. C is the name and address of the person who's gonna be overseeing the grant project or grant administrator, if funded. If an organization is applying, the contact name is a representative authorized to conduct its business. If the contact person is not the project administrator, please explain this further on in section M of the application. And the grant administrator and owner can be the same person. Okay, section D. This is um, to help us determine if the grantee, if awarded, would get 80% or 50% of the reimbursement. And if you aren't sure of your status, um, you can contact us and we can help you determine which selection would be best for you. Um, if you're more than one, use the explanation box to explain. The next session section is if you're listed on the state register, national register, or within a district, and or national historic landmark. So you'll want to select that, and you can find um, what your property is listed as on KHRI or you can call or email us and we can help you. If you're listed within a historic district, there's a box there um, to put the historic district that you're listed in. If you're not listed in a district and individually listed, you can leave that blank. We've also added a section um, as to whether you plan to utilize the federal or state tax credit program because that'll just help with us planning if a grant is awarded. Or if a grant is not awarded, we can help you through that tax credit process. 
And then section F is just a very brief overview of the project for which you're seeking funding. Think of it as your Sparks Notes version of your project. It needs to be short, sweet, and to the point. This is the first introduction of your project to the grant committee. So for example, funding is needed to address the 24 original wood windows in the Smith house. The windows are suffering from rot and deterioration. So don't worry about explaining your need for the grant or how the property came to be in this condition in this section. You really just wanna do a very brief introduction in this uh, box. Section G and kind of the next um, few sections, make sure to keep your answers concise because there is a character limit on each box. Um, so you'll need to be as concise as possible. We, um, all the properties are listed on the National or State Register. So um, especially with this one, the historical significance of the property, try to think outside the box about why it's significant because all of the properties are significant and listed on the state or national register. So what makes your project or your property unique? Um, so these questions require you to give a written account and justification of your project. Make sure your answers are clear and concise so that anyone unfamiliar with the project can understand its objectives. Don't assume that the Heritage Trust Fund Committee understands the importance of your project. You need to convince them that you have planned and will be able to implement a successful project. Uh, section H talks about community benefit and support. Part of the state statute requires applicants to deter demonstrate the potential benefit to the community and the state, as well as community support for the project. Um, be sure to summarize how much support you have from the community in this section, but you need to back it up with letters of support from community members. And you can submit five to 10 um, support letters, uh, and this will be in section O at the end of the application. So you need to um, explain how it's gonna benefit your community or state, and then the community support and demonstrate that again by su submitting those um, letters. Section I talks about the condition of the property and the urgency of the work. So the state statute that created this grant requires that the grant committee consider the condition of the property, the urgency of the preservation work proposed as part of the criteria for selecting awardees. Often this urgency piece is the most critical to the grant committee. If the need isn't urgent, then why would they recommend funding it now? So briefly describe how the property came to be in its current condition. Maybe you purchased it and it was already in a very deteriorated state. So you'd wanna explain that. What are the causes of the current problem? Maybe there was a fire. So you can explain that in your application. Have you been the property owner and have you maintained it in the past? Why is it urgent that they fund this project now? Um, and you can, and like I was saying, uh, properties, that are projects that involve the exterior envelope tend to compete better because they protect the building as a whole. And I said there was usually around 60 applications a year. We're only able to fund about a quarter of those each year. And so the committee has really tough decisions to make. And so they try to pick the most urgent and critical projects that if they are not funded, could impact the building in the future. Section J talks about the endangered part of the property. This question also has to do with urgency. Don't leave any section blank. You won't be able to, but make sure to try and fill in each section with a concise answer. State your case as to why the current conditions are endangering the property. What might happen if you don't address the urgent priorities 
written in the section above? And how will this grant help with the urgency and the endangerment of the project? So you wanna explain how your property is endangered. Is there development encroaching? Is there erosion, lack of maintenance by previous owner, deterioration, poor construction, a fire or um, natural disaster? Explain how you, your proposed project is gonna address that in this section. The next section talks about financial need. State your case for why you need this grant and why the grant committee should fund your request above all others. And it's important to talk about if you've utilized other grants, tax credits, personal savings for, on previous repairs, um, because this shows that the grant committee that you are committed to the project and you've um, taken the effort to do some work to stabilize and maybe this is um, a component that is above your budget, um, what other funding sources are available for the project. Um, for example, um, we have a bandstand in Eskridge, Kansas that is not eligible for um, tax credits because it's not um, habitable structure. And so it's really only eligible for the Heritage Trust Fund grant. And so they talked about that in their application. Um, and then are you applying for other grants, loans, or tax credits? Um, you can include that in this section. Um, but please note that grants are not, the grant itself is not eligible for tax credits, but your match, your 20% match, as long as it's more than $5,000, is eligible for the tax credit program. Section L talks about um, match requirements. Again, this is a reimbursement grant program. You need to demonstrate that you have at least the 20% or 50% match by the deadline. And it's important to show that you have at least enough to um, cash flow of the project until reimbursement um, is uh, granted. Because um, again, grantees need to pay the bills as they come due, then seek reimbursement. Reimbursements are processed as quickly as possible, usually within 30 days. And in what form is your match in? Is it a loan agreement, cash savings, another grant? Um, a lot of times, if you have a loan agreement, from a bank, you upload that letter, you can include um, bank statements to show that you have um, the amount of match or above the grant match. And that is where you would explain in the match requirements and then attach that later in the application. And the grant committee doesn't, um, are the only ones seeing your materials so it's secure um, and they're not downloaded later. Section M talks about your administ applica applicant's administrative ability. So this is your grant administrator. And we like to have just one representative for your project um, that we work with. You want to make sure that person knows they are the grant administrator when you fill out the application and that they want the job. Um, we can change it after the grant's awarded, but um, all emails are going to go to that person and up until that point. Um, why are they suitable for this role? Um, it should be someone who can work with the project team and us as the HTF staff needs to be able to keep records, provide monthly progress reports, and someone you expect to remain with the project the whole time. The state statute that created this program requires the grant committee to take into consideration the administrative ability of the applicant. When considering grant awards, make a case for why the grant administrator will be a good choice. What experience do they have? Have they um, Maybe they've managed a previous Heritage Trust Fund grant or um, have been maintaining or 
overseeing the construction project thus far. Um, maybe their professional job involves project management or budgeting. So those would be important, important information to include in this section. You want to show the grant committee why, um, because if they're going to award you $90,000, they want someone who's going to be able to manage that um, well and efficiently and with detailed records. Section N, this is the one place in the application that you can use additional pages outside the character limit. This section will form the basis of that grant agreement that I talked about earlier. If your project is funded, make sure the information is accurate to the best of your ability. Itemize out your proposed budget and schedule. Describe your proposed scope of work in as much detail as you know at that moment. Additional details will be needed before you go out to bid for a contractor. Now we do understand that you may need to get estimates um, or quotes from contractors in order to fill out the application, you would still need to go out to bid. Now you can do um, the competitive bidding process ahead of time if you so choose. And a lot of um, municipalities already have that um, requirement in place. So as long as it's documented and you'll wanna talk to um, me if you want to do competitive bidding ahead of time, just to make sure that you have all the requirements that the grant would have. Um, the grant review committee needs to know in this section what you're doing, how you're gonna do it, when you plan to do it, and how much you think it's gonna cost. So items need to be distinct portions of physical work that can be completed and then submitted for reimbursement. The schedule and draft budget as a basis, we use this as a basis for the project agreement if it's funded. Reimbursements from the grant award will be given on a base on 100% completion of each line item. So we can't um, reimburse for partial work or um, mobilization costs, demolition. It needs to be a fully completed um, scope of work item. So say plumbing is involved in the project and you have the plumbing work done, but your ceiling is still down. Well, your tin ceiling needs to go back up before we can reimburse for the tin ceiling and the plumbing all at once, um, because we wanna make sure that the building is in a finished state before we um, reimburse any section. So consider the breakdown of your budget carefully. Um, again, we, do you use this to um, base your project agreement, but it can be amended if you go out to bid and it comes back way differently than you expect or something happens during the course of the time from when it's awarded or from when you apply to when it's awarded. So maybe um, you have a wall collapse and that would change the scope of your project. So we can amend it, but do the best that you can to break it down into those um, segments. So the next slide talks about um, just an example project schedule and budget. Um, so say you have some masonry repair that's gonna cost around 36,000 and you think that's gonna be completed in March, 2022. It probably would be later than that because the grants wouldn't be awarded until February. Um, but under that masonry repair, you've got um, a little bit more detail. Then your roof work is around 22,000, estimated completion date of March, 2022. Then you've got windows and doors for 5,400 and completing in June, 2022. Generally reimbursements that are less than 5,000 will not be processed. And so we'll wait to process it with another reimbursement. Um, but we can discuss that as it comes along. Competitive bidding is not required for work under $5,000, but anything over $5,000 that's being funded by the grant is required to go out for competitive bidding. HTF grantees are not required to accept the lowest bid when seeking contractors. Um, 
described work must follow the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. If you have questions on whether the work you have proposed for the grant meets the Secretary of Interior standards, you can contact um, SHPO staff and we will do our best to help you and give you um, recommendations for more um, for treatments that would meet the standards if in the case that something you had suggested does not meet the standards. Again, um, HTF cannot reimburse for mobilization costs, um, ripping off a roof, taking out windows, opening up a wall or ceiling, et cetera. And HTF will only reimburse once that roof is reinstalled, the windows repaired and reinstalled, and the wall or ceiling is closed back up. So again, the setup fees, material costs, partial work are not reimbursable expenses by themselves. The work has to be 100% complete, a distinct portion or line item. It needs to be in the grant agreement during the grant period, meet the Secretary of Interior standards. We need to have photos showing that completed work, the bills or invoices, and then the proof of payment, which could be receipts, statements, or um, canceled checks. And we go over this information more in detail if awarded during the grant administrator training. So no line items for setup, demolition, or mobilization um, are eligible for reimbursement by themselves. So for example, um, it's recommended that you would do six windows. If you couldn't cash flow all of the windows at once, you could do six windows on the north for $10,000 and six windows on the south for $10,000. What's not recommended is to remove the 12 windows for $5,000 you wouldn't be able to submit for reimbursement for that removal or for the repair. You wouldn't be able to seek reimbursement until the full 12 windows are reinstalled. Um, however, it may be easier for the contractor to do it in a different way. So asking your contractor to do work based on the line items in your budget may mean the cost could be higher. So you'll wanna take that into consideration. Now, we will withhold 10% retainage from each reimbursement, and grantees are also encouraged to withhold our retainage from their contractors pending completion of the project. Five to 10% is common. Now, this allows the grantee to have some assurances that the project will complete, be completed to their satisfaction. And that's again why we withhold the 10% retainage to make sure that the project is complete, meets the standards. And we also have a project sign, which you see on the slide that we want back um, so that we can reuse those for the next grant round. So just here's an example of how a reimbursement might look for one grant item. The contractor completes those west side windows and bills you for $10,000. Your contract allows you to withhold 10%. So you pay the contractor $9,000. Now we're not gonna hold your retainage with the contractor against you. So you give us the invoice for $10,000 with proof of payment of the 9,000. We're gonna take 80% of the $10,000 invoice, which is $8,000. Now we're gonna take our own 10% retainage from that grant portion of $800. So your reimbursement for 10,000, the $10,000 um, request would be 7,200. So you need to also keep that in mind for cash flow that if you're submitting for a $10,000 reimbursement, you're not getting back $8,000. You're getting back your bill times the 80% um, minus retainage. So it's gonna be less than you expect that you're getting back. Because we use this grant as um, federal match, we that support other programs administered by the State Historic Preservation Office, this program has to follow the same procurements as federal funding, which includes seeking competitive bids for any work or product over $5,000. 
Now, if the work is under $5,000, say you need um, $4,000 worth of architecture um, work, you don't have to be, you don't have to go out to bid for that work, though we encourage it. Um, you still need to meet, the contract needs to meet the requirements of the HTF grant. So um, we'll talk about that in the grant administrator um, training if awarded. Um, Non-competitive directly negotiated contracts may be approved by us on a case-by-case -case basis. An example would be a sole, um, sole funding, like um, say you have a WF Norman tin ceiling. They're pretty much the only ones who manufacture those and they still have the original molds. That would be a sole, um, sole product. Um, so you wouldn't be able to find, you wouldn't need to go out to bid because they're the only ones who do it. Or if you have a vitrolite storefront, there's one guy in St. Louis who works on vitrolite storefronts. Um, that would be an example of where you wouldn't need to go out to bid. Um, and then required bidding process is outlined in Appendix A and B at the end of the program information handout. So what needs to be done? You need to write it up, draw it out, um, get approval. Who's qualified to do that? Invite them to bid on your project. Give them time to reply to your invite. That's part of the competitive bidding. You have it open for 21 days at a minimum. You wanna evaluate those replies and to make a decision based off um, criteria you've set in place before um, going out to bid. You wanna send, once you've made the decision, you send the competitive bidding documents to us and a draft contract, and then we would give you approval and you can sign the contract and begin work. Now, ideally grants will, grantees um, will wait for notice of their grant award and seek approval of their preliminary scope of work by the SHPO before putting a project out to bid, but it is acknowledged that some projects will be better served by upfront coordination with a consultant and or contractor. So successful grant applicants must be able to demonstrate to us upon request that the consultants and or contractors hired prior to the grant award were chosen through an open and fair competitive bidding process. And you can look at those appendices for um, the documentation that we will need. And again, if you plan to do bidding ahead of time, um, you can talk through that with me um, either on the phone or via email. Are you gonna be using services of an architecture, architect or engineer? Only include the consultant services in your budget if you intend those services to be a part of the expenses reimbursed to you by the grant. Projects that involve structural stabilization or restoration of a missing feature generally require the services of professional consultants and those services can be reimbursed by HTF or you can pay via other sources. Projects that involve simple repairs and replacement in kind of existing features generally don't require consultant services, but can be included. The next slide just um, further takes that um, budget example that we had. It has the consultant in it. So in, there's a spreadsheet in the application that you're gonna put the subtotal of the construction costs, which are in red, then your contingency for the um, construction costs, which is 20%. Um, then you'll put your consultant fees. So you'll take the subtotal of your construction costs, the contingency based off that number, plus your contingency, and that's gonna be your total project cost. So your grant request is gonna be 80% of that. And it does automatically um, formulate your um, some of your numbers, but then you have to find um, figure your eighty percent um, yourself because it could be fifty percent if you're a for profit corporation. So section N, be sure to 
calculate the 20% contingency, like I said, from that construction costs only. Um, you also need to estimate your completion date. And remember to keep in mind the timeline, try not to be too optimistic. Um, it does take some time. Um, so you wanna put that in there. And this is the formula um, chart that is in the application. You're gonna add the consultant fees. It totals the project expenses, and then you need to figure the request. It's typically 80%, and that number cannot exceed $90,000. While most grant requests will be 80% of the project, remember that for-profit corporations may only request 50% of the project total up to 90,000. Bethany, this is Katrina. Sure. Hey, I wanted to just point out to everybody, because I know sometimes it's confusing, the 20% contingency is not the same as your 20% match. So contingency is extra money that we are asking you to add in to basically pad your budget in case something unexpected happens. So you need to add that to the construction total as sort of just extra money that you might need in case there's a problem that happens. It becomes part of your project total and then your reimbursement of 80% is the grant. You still have a 20% match that you'll end up paying after reimbursement. It's just the fact that it kind of you know, is a coincidence that they both are 20%, but they really have nothing to do with each other. Good point. Thanks, Katrina. That is a confusing point that we get a lot of questions about. Um, so after you filled out this section, there's attachments. Um, you're going to do any budget or um, scope of work attachments. You're going to do photos and your letters of support are you're going to attach here. Um, at least five to 10 um, letters of support must be attached to the application. And please note that any letters of support that are sent directly to the Kansas Historical Society and not attached to your application will be put in the file, but the grant committee will not see those. So make sure that you have you receive the letters of support and upload them into the application. Um, be selective in where you're getting those letters of support. They can really um, make an impact on your application. Um, we had a schoolhouse that had um, some students who had visited on a field trip write a letter and that kind of pulls at the heartstrings of your committee. Um, whereas letters from Congress and politicians are sometimes effective, but letters from people with a personal connection to the property generally have more of an impact. Um, and you also want to upload a preservation plan. This can be a one to two page outline. Um, if you need an example, we're happy to provide that to you. This just summarizes the larger preservation plan of the project. Say you've already done some work, this is a larger portion that you're asking for, and then you've got more work you're going to do after. If you don't already have a preservation plan, now's a good time to think about writing one up. You can even include a list of future wants and needs um, is a good start to this preservation plan. The grant committee just wants to know that you have a plan in place um, when you're applying for this grant. So I said that there's also a section for up uploading photos. No more than 20 images should be attached. Um, choose your file name, label carefully. Um, you can make it, um, say you have a historic photo, you can say 1903 historic photo. Um, you could say, Southwest facade, window detail, um, to give the grant committee an idea of what they're looking at. Or maybe number the images so that they are presented in the order that you prefer. 
Also be aware of the quality of your photos. Sometimes um, if you're trying to get a close up from afar of a window, your phone's not gonna take the best picture. So you may have to get out your old fashioned camera, digital camera and take those photos um, with a higher quality camera. So acceptable photo attachments, um, it can be done in a Word document, a PDF. You can do individual JPEGs, TIFF documents. Um, if you have historic photos, um, especially in the case of reconstructing, that should be um, uh, included. Photos need to be color unless they're historic and they must show the architectural features clearly. The applicant is the sole responsible is solely responsible for the clarity of the photos and photocopies. Um, awarded grantees will be asked to provide JPEG formatted photos in the case that you submit them as a document or PDF. So it's important um, to make your first photo the pretty overall shot. We call it the three corner shot. Photos taken from a corner of a property allow the viewer to see not only the front facade, but also one side and a little bit of the environment surrounding it, just to give the grant committee a better idea and feel for your project. Um, these photos um, will show the areas of deterioration or where work is required. So close-ups of the damage and deterioration are important, but don't just submit too close up of a photo without context, like a picture of water damage close up isn't going to be as effective as a, you know, a further wide shot showing buckets holding water. Um, you can get creative with your pictures. You want to paint the picture to the grant committee that you need the money to do this project and why. You can also add arrows or circle items as needed to point out the work items that need done um, and be able be sure to label each photo and the work items shown. You can use pencils, rulers, straight edges, or other props to damage to illustrate damage like rotted wood or soft plaster. Photos of buckets, like I said, to catch water from leaking roofs, carpenters levels to show on even floors might be needed to better illustrate the problem. You need to call out the problems in the note or file name. So photography has gotten pretty, um, pretty good. And now, and you can be creative. You can use lifts, drones, or other means to show damage and deterioration that may be otherwise hard to reach. Um, here's an example of a drone footage that shows the three corner shot with context. And they were trying to show roof. Roofs are really hard to show because you either need to be on top of them from another building or um, accessing the roof. And some roofs may not be stable to stand on. So again, be creative when you're putting photo documentation on your application. Now you wanna provide adequate information, but try not to include too much information um, so that the reviewers can't see the detail or read the text. Um, grant reviewers are going to be looking at upwards of 60 applications, so piling multiple images onto one page may cause more confusion than clarity. The grant reviewers use the photos to familiarize themselves with the project. If they can't see what is in need of repair, how are they going to know that you need the HTF monies? Again, be careful not to show details too close up. You want to show perspective and in relation to other objects and features. Now, I, the final um, attachment at the end of the application is the assurances. The, um, don't forget to read, sign, and attach the assurances page, and it's found at the website with the link um, to the application. Please note, especially number five, that grantee, part of what you're signing in the assurances um, is grantees are expected to pay all project costs and then seek reimbursement for a portion of them. And then number six is also important. The HTF grant agreement will require owners to maintain the ownership of the property for five years 
following completion of the grant. Also, owners must maintain the grant funded work during that five year period. Um, if you're doing other work after the grant closes out, but with, is it within your five years, um, we do review any work done to the property during that five year period. Um, it can be in the form of a tax credit application if it's an eligible project, or um, you can just let us know and we will review the work. And um, if you sell the property within the five years, it's um, you have to pay back the grant monies that you were reimbursed and it's done in a prorated fashion. Um, so if you sell in the first year, you have to sell or you have to return 100% of the grant funds. If it's in the last five, in the fifth year, you pay back 20%. So this is kind of a long-term investment that the grant committee is looking for. So here's some further thoughts. The Historic Preservation Office, we're here to help. Whether you receive a grant or not, every building tells a story. You're competing with many others who have equally important projects. Tell your story. Convince the reviewers why yours is the best. Have you convinced the reviewers? Have you had someone else read your application to make sure it makes sense? We are happy to provide you technical assistance, um, regardless of whether your property receives a grant or not. Um, best wishes and good luck on the application. Again, my name is Bethany Falvey and I'm the HTF grant manager and I'm happy to answer any questions, but here's my contact information. Um, if you think of something after the presentation. You can type them in the chat or um, raise your hand and we can unmute you or you might be able to unmute yourself. Does anyone have any questions? There is no application fee. It's free to apply. That was a question in the chat. Are there any other questions? Um, do we have to have the 90K like fluid in cash or like, can we do it in like portions? Does that make sense? Like as in like- this So you don't possible. have to have the 90,000. You need to document that you have at least the 20% match. So if you're asking for 90,000, your project total is gonna be 120,000. So you need 20% of that total. I um, think the, the thing that I'm hung up on is that we're expected to pay the, the them after it's completed, right? Um, if it costs 90K, we're expected to pay the 90K and then we'll get it back or? You'll get, if, it, if you're, if you do all of the work at once and it's $90,000, you would get percent of that 90,000 minus the 10 percent retainage but you can break it up into smaller items so say it's harder if it's just a roof because a roof you know it's one one line item basically but say your project involves a roof it involves masonry work um, even masonry work can be broken down into sides of the building so if it's fifty thousand dollars to repoint the whole building, but you can break that into sides. You work with your contractor and um, not all contractors will do that, but you can work with your contractor to break it down into manageable sizes for you to cash flow the project. So say one facade is $10,000 to repoint. You can finish that side, then submit for reimbursement and move on to the next facade. So then you have, you're not going to get the full 10,000 back. You'll get the 80% minus the 10% retainage. So that's the 7,200 that you would get back. So that's important when you're trying to figure out the cash flow of your project. Yeah. And then um, my only other question is the time limit. So we can do that in stages. Got that. Um, how long can we do that? Seven the grant? Um, we try to get grants to compete, uh, complete within two years of being awarded. Um, 
And that's just, we have pressure from the legislators to get projects completed because the funding is allocated. And every year that a project doesn't finish, we have to encumber those funds. So it's important to show the grant committee that you have the cash in hand, you're ready to move forward and you can complete that project. Um, yes, the access, um, there's a question, will we be able to access the recording of today's presentation? I'll upload that to the website um, where the application is found. Um, when is the retainage amount released? Um, once the project is completed 100%, you've done a completion report and return the sign is when the retainage is returned. Now that can be done all at once with your last reimbursement request or it can be after. Um, can you review previous applications? We can um, provide you with example applications. Um, you can just email us. Um, Katrina listed the consultants and contractors um, on our website. Those, um, we don't have a recommended list, but these are um, consultants and contractors who have done work on historic properties in the past. What other questions do we have? And again, if you think of some after, um, you can email us or call us. Um, and you can also rewatch the app, um, this presentation. Um, and again, the deadline's not till November 1st. So you've got plenty of time. The application is live. Um, you can be working on your draft. Um, and we, there have been, so don't wait till the deadline to submit because sometimes there could be some technical issues. Um, it is an online computer pr um, program. We didn't have too many issues last year, but you know, it's always good to plan ahead um, to account for any issues you may have. If there are no further questions, um, thank you for attending. And if you have questions, you can reach out to us. Bethany, this is Katrina. Yep. Um, I just had one recommendation from folks that I remember last year. Um, lots of people said this was helpful. Um, we recommend going through and reading through the application online and then writing out your essay answers like on a Word document separately. That way you can edit, manipulate, kind of, you know, work on it 